Hello, hello, hello. Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. We're in the heat of Phoenix, Arizona. And, you know, Arizona is either heaven or hell, and it's getting close to hell right now. But it's the dry heat, as they say. And we have a very special show today, as, as all of our shows are, but it's a um, man I tremendously respect. He's looked up to. You know, those, those are people who, that are just the pillars in any industry. And this gentleman is the pillar in this industry. And he's Rick Rule, founder of Rule Investment Media. And when he speaks, people listen. And we're going to be speaking about one of my favorite subjects today is precious metals, which is gold and silver. But it's not about that. And by the way, we don't recommend anybody, you know, we're an information company. We don't recommend buying anything, although I think you're foolish if you don't. But anyway. <laughs> The point here is this, is that um, I just love the precious metals market, and we're going to go into why, if you haven't started, or if you have started, you know, as they say, back up the truck. So this is Rick Rule, and Rick, welcome to the show. Robert, thank you so much. I always enjoy our interviews, and uh, thank you, too, for the yeah. Rich Dad Poor Jad work you've done, particularly around financial literacy. I uh, yeah. I think uh, you're the epitome of the rich dad. So thank you. Well, thank you. Sixty five. I was uh, I was eighteen or nineteen years old or something, and we're from Vietnam was on. And I started. I went for flight school. Went to military school, flight school, and I was flying in Vietnam. And then seventy one, Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. So I'm sitting on this aircraft carrier, South China Seas you know, wondering what the hell are we doing here? And um, suddenly my rich dad sends me, I didn't, I didn't realize this, he sends me a letter. He says, look out, look out, look out. So what happened? You know, I mean, there's a snail mail those days. He says, Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. So this is 72 now, by the time I got the message, it was August 15th, 1971. And he says, my rich dad basically said, if you can find any kind of gold or silver, buy it. So I'm flying, I was a gunship pilot, we flew off the carrier, and being Marines, we weren't the smartest guys on earth. And the North Vietnamese Army had overrun the, um, I, was, I was looking for a gold mine on the map, you know, reading the, you know, reading the map of South Vietnam. The North Vietnamese had overrun the gold mine. So being Marines, we said, well, what the hell, let's go go for it. So we flew behind enemy lines to buy gold, and there was a little Vietnamese woman standing there. She was probably about five foot one, you know. <clears throat> I don't think she went to Harvard or anything. She had red beetle teeth. And so I was standing in the middle of this village, the Vietnamese saying, who are these two whack jobs sitting here? You know, my pilot and co-pilot. And gold was, I think, about 50 bucks an ounce by that time. It had gone from 35 to 50. And I, I tried to get a discount. <laughs> <laughs> and Rick, do you know how far I got? I I can imagine. Uh, you know, nowhere. In effect, you thought you were trading money for an asset, and she thought you were trading money for money. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, she she just kind of she kind of looked at my my you know we're both college graduates. She goes spot. Right. So want a spot on my shirt or something? <laughs> I had no idea. So Rick, that was my introduction to gold. So I think uh, we, when I, I'm going to talk to you about the, you, you call it the circus. They removed the debt ceiling. It's only gotten worse in 71, hasn't it? Well, that's a, you know, that's a really interesting uh, lead in, Robert. I'm, <laughs> I'm amazed that so many people were concerned about uh, the, pol the politics of raising the debt ceiling. And people don't seem to be concerned about the quantum of the debt. Uh, or the ability to service the debt, or more importantly, the impact of the debt on future generations of Americans. Uh, yeah. A review of the arithmetic, if you might indulge me, uh, I think is worthwhile. A at the federal level, uh, we now have permission to take the debt, I guess, to 34 trillion, 400 and something million dollars. The first thing that people need to understand is that that's 12 zeros to the left of the furthest, to the right of the furthest left column. I mean, it's an amazing number. But if you compare the on balance sheet liabilities of the United States with the off balance sheet liabilities, the net present value of the off balance sheet liabilities, it gets scarier. 
for your younger listeners, Robert, if they look at pictures of you and I, they see what an off-balance sheet liability looks like. It's an old person. Medicare, <laughs> Medicaid, Social Security, federal pensions. That number, the net present value, according to the Congressional Budget Office, handily exceeds $100 trillion. So, so that's, the, the old guys are going to cut our, our liability of $100 trillion. The combination of off-balance sheet liabilities, non-balance sheet liabilities, note that's net present value, not gross value, exceeds $140 trillion. Now, it's interesting that J.P. Morgan Chase notes that the amount of private wealth, which will be handed down to future generations, uh, is about $140 trillion, which is a different way of saying that the entirety of uh, private inheritances is accounted for by the federal debt before state and local debt. And it's further important, I think, uh, Robert, for your listeners to consider that we propose to service this debt, both on balance sheet and off balance sheet, with a budget that's in deficit $2 trillion a year. <laughs> I don't know what your rich dad would suggest about further encumbrances if you were already over indebted but I suspect I know the answer, and I suspect you might inform your listeners as to what that was. Well, let, let me let me keep it. My my rich dad, my my poor dad was a PhD, went to Stanford, Northwest University, of Chicago, but that's why he was poor. <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> but my and my rich dad never went to school. So, I mean, he went to school up to thirteen, so he kept everything simple. He says that's like trying to pay your what you're talking about with the debt and all this. That's like trying to pay your mortgage with your credit card. Right, right. <laughs> That's exactly what we're doing. Well, my own dad, stepfather, uh, I remember telling me, you know, one of the ways you get out of holes, you stop digging, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he went to Stanford. So, you know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we can anymore. I, I, have we gone beyond the point of no return? I'm not sure, Robert. I, uh, you know, I'm of two minds. I'm astonished at the strength of the U.S. economy uh, in the face of increasingly idiotic regulation, stupefying taxation, uh, and debt. And I draw some solace from the fact that, well, two facts. One, youth movements. 160,000 people having been through the programs of Students for Liberty over time. You know, Robert, when I was 18 years old, I couldn't spell libertarian. Uh, <laughs> and now we got 160,000 junior von Mises running around, which makes me feel good. I also feel good, uh, I need to say, with uh, the continued impact of technology. The United States is still this wonderful creative culture where, you know, five or six pimply faced kids uh, in Sunnyvale can commandeer a garage and out pops Google or out pops Facebook. I guess what I'm trying to say is I remain hopeful that our individual creativity and tenacity might be able somehow to finance our collective stupidity. Uh, oh, the, you are an optimist. You know, I, mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the <laughs> alternative for that, Robert, would be for me to quit. Uh, and I'm uh, America wasn't built quitting. I think what you're doing, I think informing people of the fact that they are responsible for their own future. <laughs> we are not responsible for their future. Uh, telling people that the Commonwealth is not necessarily their friend, uh, I think is extremely valuable. And in fact, it is grassroots efforts like yours and Students for Liberty uh, that give me continued hope. Uh, you know, Albert, uh, go ahead. What is Students for Liberty? I've never heard of them. Students for Liberty is a libertarian students organization okay. funded by old geezers like me, but run by the kids. Uh, okay. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm delighted with the work they do. I'm delighted particularly when I juxtapose the knowledge I see in these young people with the knowledge that I had when I was their age. Now, maybe that's damning them by faint praise because I didn't know much. But I do find in movements like Students for Liberty and in the popul popularity of shows like yours, substantial cause for optimism. Uh, I, I must admit, when I uh, divert 
from these sort of positive narratives to the arithmetic, uh, I become less positive. <laughs> well, I, you're far more positive than me, so it's an interesting time. Let me tell you, this is the way I look at it. This is what I was excited to talk to you about it. Like I said, in 72, I mean, I'm trying to buy my first gold. And I, I, I couldn't cut a deal. She would not discount gold. I just couldn't believe this. So I finally had to fly to Hong Kong. We, we, we sell into Hong Kong and I bought a Krugeran and I paid 50 bucks for it. I still have that Krugeran today. What the Krugeran's worth probably how much today? 2000 bucks, I'm guessing. I, I haven't looked at spot. Well, it would sell a premium to spot even if you sold it back. So yeah, yeah. 2000 yeah. bucks. Yeah, nice return. Yeah, so for, for years I've been saying to people, and then I, and then, so today I, I took the largest gold mine in America public this summer. That was ODV out of uh, Utah. And I'm, I've been a gold bug ever since because I'm still singing, we're on the eve of destruction in my head. And I like silver and all this. And I tell people, look, just buy one silver. You know, here's a, here's a silver half dollar. I think I don't know what, it was about 35 bucks or something. I said, everybody can afford this but they'd rather hang on to cash. And you know, when you hold, when you hold the Krugeran up, it was $50 and today it's 2000 in cash. Rick, we can be optimists, but why can't people get the correlation between 50 bucks and 2000? I think that's important. Well, you know, when I look at um, my own personal portfolio, I'm the largest shareholder of Sprott, which is a financial services concern built around precious metals. A financial planner would say, Rick, you're insane to own any physical <laughs> gold and silver. You're already yeah, so do. leveraged to gold and silver, you know, uh, you figuratively have it coming out of every orifice. But the truth is that I regard physical precious metals uh, as insurance. And yes. I must say at age 70, seeing what I've seen in my lifetime, it helped me, helps me sleep nights and stay calm. <laughs> and so let's assume just for fun, that your listeners put 10% of your net, their net worth in bullion. And let's assume just for fun that the price didn't go up at all. But it was a hedge. It was insurance uh, against some of the madness around them. In truth, Robert, I need to say, I hope my, my gold and silver bullion doesn't escalate rapidly in price. Yeah. Because right. if it did, uh, it would invariably be the result of circumstances that would make the rest of my life very unpleasant. And the truth is that my life is very pleasant. Uh, right. I think wait, wait, as you wait, said, wait. at the beginning of the show, I, it's very difficult for me to understand why somebody who can afford to save at all doesn't save partly in gold or silver. Right. I mean, I agree 100%, but you just said something that's really important. Although I have, I basically have tons of gold and silver in the ground, you know, so I have silver mines in Argentina and gold mines in Utah and China, but I don't want it to go up. <laughs> if you know what I mean? Because if it did, I would, I would need to get a gun and go back to Vietnam or something. Yep. Isn't that, I mean, that's how critical you know, the song Eve of Destruction. We're so critical right now. And I don't trust our leaders to get us out of it right now. I would agree with that. Uh, and again, uh, we should probably, in terms of the discussion, default to arithmetic. Uh, I, I won't replay the debt and deficit arithmetic because I already did it. But let's talk yeah. about quantitative easing. Uh, very recently, the government decided to bail out the banks uh, and collaterally the depositors. And as I understand it, uh, they created a trillion dollars in bailout funds. Now, they didn't borrow it. They didn't have it. Uh, that was called quantitative easing, uh, although they had some different name for it. Right. If you printed, uh, you know, uh, Kiyosaki's uh, and tried to buy houses or bread or things like that, they'd put you in prison. It would be called counterfeiting. Right. But if they do right. it, it's called quantitative easing. Whatever you call it, Making more currency units from nothing does not make the existing currency units more valuable. They are debasing the currency. It's important <clears throat> to understand that math. They just created a trillion dollars worth of currency units that didn't show up as a liability. So it has to show up as debasement. Um, 
Could you explain debasement? Because that's a very important word, again. You know, yeah, well, I mean, definition. let's assume that the value of the float of the U.S. dollar, I don't know what it is, but let's assume just for fun it's $100 trillion. I have no idea what it really is. If they make uh, another $5 trillion, by the way, the Fed's balance sheet is all debasement. Um, if they create these new units out of thin air, backed by nothing, what they do is they... Uh, reduce by the same quantum the value of the existing currency units. So if there were a, a, a hundred trillion currency units, dollars in circulation, and they created uh, seven trillion new ones, which is the net of the Fed's balance sheet, they have debased the value of the existing hundred trillion by 7%. It's really, really, really simple arithmetic. That, that, uh, that means that the, the cash in your hand has got less valuable. Sure. That's that, what that, debasement means. Yeah, that's important. And I think the third thing, that uh, fourth thing, pardon me, that people need to consider is uh, the product of debasement, which is uh, diminishment of the purchasing power, uh, particularly uh, in the value of savings. And by the way, I'm not telling people not to save. I'm just saying understand the arithmetic. If you buy a U.S. government 10-year treasury, they propose to pay you, I think it's what, 3.4% today, something like that. In a currency that the Congressional Budget Office suggests is losing purchasing power by about 7% a year. In other words, they guarantee to reduce your purchasing power by 4% a year compounded. Now, you know, that, 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 math, that math is just too high for me. It's pretty scary, isn't it? Uh, I mean, yeah, you, you, it, it, they're, they're, <laughs> and, and they, by the they, way, uh, it's too hard for me. <laughs> they are they are using uh, the CPI, uh, and, and I don't want to get into a really ridiculous discussion of the CPI, but I want to leave your listeners with a certain understanding of the CPI. First of all, it's consumer cool. price index, you guys. Yeah, consumer price index, allegedly a cost of living index. Now. When it suits them, they don't include food or fuel in the cost or of living. Right. Right. Your um, listeners can look at me and tell that I like to eat. So <laughs> uh, an index that doesn't include food or, food or fuel is not too relevant to me. But more importantly than that, Robert, and I'll never understand this, the CPI index doesn't include the cost of government. It doesn't include tax. No. That is certainly, unfortunately, part of my cost of living. Uh, yeah. The truth is that sustaining federal, state, and local government uh, consumes more of the average family's income than shelter, energy, food, and transportation combined. So <laughs> when, when you don't include taxation, both direct and indirect, in computing Jeez. the cost of living, you have to be very concerned about the index. Now, to be honest with you, Robert... I think if I didn't have to pay the tax, I would complain less about the index. <laughs> but that, that isn't on offer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll be right back. Last month, reports of inflation hitting 9.1% sent markets into a death spiral. It's the steepest rise in the cost of living since 1981. Biden, Yellen, and Powell, they might need to check the definition of transitory because this spells disaster for tens of millions of Americans and their savings. At this rate, the dollars under your mattress will lose half their buying power by 2030. But Robert saw this coming, he's seen it before. He knew that equities would be crushed by inflation, which is why he recommends real assets like art. The same assets that outpaced the S&P 500 by more than double for the last 25 years. In fact, the last time inflation was this high, it did even better, appreciating by 33% annually, according to the Masterworks All Art Index. The only problem, unless you're a millionaire, investing in art has been nearly impossible. But now, thanks to Masterworks, you can invest in arts like Banksy and Basquiat in just a few taps, and the results speak for themselves. Masterworks has delivered average net returns of 26.8% to their investors since 2019. And with inflation on the rise, demand for Masterworks is through the roof, and there's even a wait list. But our listeners can skip it by going to masterworks.art richdad. That's masterworks.art slash richdad. 
See important disclosures at masterworks.io slash CD. Today's show is sponsored by Gold Alliance. If you're concerned about high inflation, looming recession, a troubled banking system, or out of control spending in Washington, this is an important message to hear. Because the fact is, during every major crisis in U.S. history, many of those who failed to prepare watch their savings, investments, or retirement funds go down, while many with the foresight to own gold helped preserve their purchasing power. Gold even made some folks richer. Now we're facing several major crises at once, and experts say we may May soon face even more economic trouble. So please don't wait. Learn the simple way you can diversify with gold and put yourself on the road to financial peace of mind, even in uncertain times. The new free 2023 Gold Guide from our friends at Gold Alliance can show you how. Just visit www.freegoldguide.com Robert or call 1-800-473-4585. Republican governor and conservative commentator Mike Huckabee says Gold Alliance is the only only gold provider he recommends to his friends and family. Find out why and visit freegoldguide.com slash Robert or call now at 1-800-473-4585. Feeling powerless over current events and your financial future? Financial freedom is your freedom. Robert Kiyosaki is the best-selling author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Over 40 million people have taken Robert's advice. Now it's your turn. Attend Robert's free virtual wealth building event. Claim your free access now at richdadfree.com. Don't wait, access is limited. Go to richdadfree.com. That's richdadfree.com. Welcome back, Robert here, second Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. What, what, what they say is what inflation is a tax that you didn't vote for. That's right. You know, something along that line. That's right. And uh, you know when Biden took the Keystone XL pipeline offline, I, I'm, I also I also I don't trust the dollar, Rick. I am I am the eve of destruction guy, so I'd rather invest in oil, you know, physical oil, cattle, land, you know, things they can't print. I'm I'm in the if you can print it, I don't want it category. So when I was pumping oil at thirty bucks a barrel when Trump was president. When Biden stepped in, his first act was to uh, cut off the Keystone XL pipeline, right. and oil went from thirty to one hundred thirty. And yeah. then he blames he blames Russia. Biden blames Russia for raising the price, or Saudi Arabia or something. Going, we elected this guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, ironically, Robert, for you and I, domestic producers, <laughs> Biden ironically has been a friend. Uh, it's bad for the country, exactly. but good for you and I. We don't have to compete with more efficient um, Canadian producers. A and at the same time uh, that he is telling the major oil companies that they need to produce more in the near term to bring gasoline prices down, he's telling them that he's going to put them out of business in 2030. Telling yeah. the major oil companies that he's going to put them out of business in 2030 is not a way to get them to spend $100 billion to increase energy security. Ironically, for existing producers like you and I, uh, he's maintaining a floor price for us. Um, right. I, I don't feel the need to thank him particularly, but it's no. an interesting conundrum. You know, Robert, further on energy around math, the International Energy Agency suggests that the uh, totality of the oil industry, including state controlled firms, is under investing in sustaining capital to the extent of about a billion US dollars a day. $365 billion a year. Well, they're, they're doing under. that despite record high industry cash flows. What they do when they defer sustaining capital investments is that they imp impair in the out years their ability to produce. So as right. a consequence of these idiotic acts by way of the big thinkers, <laughs> they're, they're going to make the oil industry, including you and me, more profitable for longer. Right. Right. It's a very odd circumstance that we face. Okay, let, 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 let me rephrase what you said. They're just not reinvesting in more production. Correct. And Correct. all that's going to do is raise the price of oil. And, you know, I, my, my degree is in oil. I went to Merch Marine Academy in New York, and I sail for Standard Oil. <laughs> right. And when uh, Biden took, the, took uh, the Keystone Pipeline offline, I made more money. Right. But he also made America poor. Correct. Correct. And that's that's and so that's why that's why you know you can be optimistic about the debt and all this stuff, but 
My challenge, Rick, has been to get somebody to let go of the cash and say, convert some of that cash, like you say, to something they cannot print. Do you know what I mean? Have some silver. Oh, no, 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 no. You know, the silver doesn't get any interest. I said, exactly what you just said. Well, inflation's at seven and they're paying you three. I mean, or four. You're still losing three. How come they can't get that, Rick? Why can't they get that? I, I must say, uh, as a consequence of the fact that I've been through several periods of illiquidity, that I still <laughs> maintain some cash, knowing that I'm losing money on my cash. No, I, I understand. I, I regard the negative interest. Cash. Uh, why do people... I regard the negative interest as an options, uh, an option <laughs> premium. Uh, right, right. Uh, what scares me, what, what really bothers me more than people's cash holdings is people's insistence on holding long bonds. Oh. Uh, or frankly, uh, although I've benefited from this, uh, sellers of real estate taking back fixed rate mortgages. Uh, the idea that you're getting paid 4% in a currency which is depreciating by seven or eight percent compounded, is it, it's odd. It's a guaranteed loss. My suspicion, and maybe you can help me with this, Robert, because you talk to more people on your channel than I do on mine. My suspicion is that people were um, people were influenced by the period 1982 to 2022 which were probably, with a couple of exceptions, the most benign economic times known to human being. Right. Uh, you know, peace, largely, uh, declining real interest rates, uh, yes. inclusion in the workforce. I right. think, I think in 2022, things changed. Yeah, please, please, please listen to what Rick said. This is one of the most important things. We've come through one of the most prosperous times in history. And they were dropping interest rates and everything was kind of happy. Everybody was, everybody was happy and going to buy and shopping and all this. And then it changed. That's kind of why I think that your message isn't as common currency as it should be. I think that people were preconditioned by 40 years of benign economic climate. Amen. to think irrespective Amen. of the asset class, you know, buy the dip. And, and then, and then what I say, what I say, Rick, is your financial, if your financial advisor is not over 50, don't listen to him, you know, because you know, they, I'm a financial planner, I'm 25 years old and, you know, it's always been good. I'm like, yeah. Oh my God, I could bring a new, new, new advisor here. Right. Because you and I have seen the ups and downs. Uh, you know, the, the decade of the seventies, uh, I'm not saying that we're going to repeat it. But it was interesting. I remember I broke into investments in financial services really in 1970 as a young college student trying to make my money make some money so that I could make ends meet. In 1970, uh, we'd been through 20 years of pretty benevolent economic times after, you know, World War Two. Right. And, and most investors worldwide couldn't spell gold. Right. Despite the fact that it was a four letter word. Right. By 1981. <laughs> Everybody could spell gold. Uh, times right. of economic change, times of political turmoil are times when precious metals do well. And if you reflect on the fact that now we've been through 40 years of benign economic cli climate, and I'm not trying to say that the world's going to go to hell in a handbasket. I'm just going to say I'm just going to say it's going to become more challenging. I think it would be useful to repeat your own message, Robert, which is to say, uh, if you are concerned about the direction of things, learn to spell gold before other people do. Uh, right. The performance of gold in the decade of the 70s, uh, relative to any other asset class available to you, was astonishing. No guarantee right. it'll happen again, but the circumstance would seem to be in place uh, to make that an intelligent activity. Well, the other thing, Rick, is Correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't silver the all-time high? It was 50 bucks. Silver, I, I I remember very well at the beginning of the decade of the 70s, silver was a buck and a half. Uh, and at the end, it was $50. Uh, and if you can afford to speculate, uh, the performance of the silver stocks was even more astonishing. One that, unfortunately, I didn't buy. Coeur d'Alene right. Mines oh, went God. from 10 cents, not a typo, to $65, not a typo. Yeah. And sadly, yeah. it did it all without me. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, the silver stocks, if you look at an asset class around precious metals that are hyper volatile, uh, that's right. the most volatile. Doug Casey <clears throat> says that the uh, population of silver stocks in the world uh, and their combined market cap is so small that when the generalist investor absorbs the silver narrative, wonderful quote, the uh, outcome is like t trying to hi uh, siphon Hoover Dam through a garden hose. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is not for the faint of heart. You know, your listeners no. who want to pay attention to that have to be prepared to take real risk, absorb volatility and do some homework. But if you want a hyper volatile asset class around precious metals, the silver stocks, while not for the faint of heart, uh, is no. that asset. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't play any stocks. I only own stocks that are companies I take public. Yep. Smart. You know? yep. Yeah. That's all I do. I mean, Control I'm your own destiny. Yeah. I'm a hardcore entrepreneur. Yep. I don't trust Wall Street, the Fed, or the mm -hmm. Treasury. And I just trust what I can see, touch, and feel. Yep. But this is my point here. Like this, fit, silver was $50 back then. And today, you can still buy a silver coin for less than it was, what, 50 years ago? Is that when it was? Well, and that's on a nominal basis. Uh, remember that we've probably experienced 65% uh, deterioration in the dollar. Yes. So if a, if a silver coin was $50 then and $22 now, understand that that's a nominal value. Uh, what, does nom what does nominal mean? Not nominal means that that doesn't take into account the depreciation of the dollar. Uh, right. Your $22 now probably has $5 worth of borrowing power when measured against the dollar in 1980, when you when you value that coin at $50. So in real terms, silver has probably fallen 90% in price. Maybe and I'm everything... wrong. Maybe it's 70%, but you get, <laughs> you, you get the arithmetic. I don't get the higher math in my brain here. I, you know, I, I never did well in school. That's why Rick, Rick is a banker and I'm a bank teller. <laughs> I was never good at math and all this. I just... I just knew that fifty dollars was less than it was yep. when I was a kid. A lot less, a lot. Less. And 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 we're gonna, we're going to need to go to a break. But the point here is this: I want to get to is I get into fights. I was talking to this friend of mine. He's got three kids and all this, and he's a hardcore saver of cash. And I said, "Why don't you just buy a silver coin? It's thirty-five bucks." Who man? He would rather save cash than a silver coin. So, see, my whole point is, Rick, all I do is when I have cash, I have cash flow from properties. Right. So I have income. I have income. I have lots of income. And, my, and you know, most of my friends, their problem is what to do with the cash. Does that make sense to you? So uh -huh. naturally, naturally, there's battle bank. They can put it in on their investments. But it's getting to the point we have these two gla classes of people, rich, right. And people with cash and people with no cash. Right. And that's where we are today. And that's where, in my opinion, we're on the eve of destruction. And I want, and I, I just can't understand why people hang on to cash when you look at the stats, look at the math. I mean, doesn't it kind of baffle you too when you talk to people? Why are you hanging on to that cash? Well, well as it's, I say, I, I do hang on to some cash. Uh, no, no, I, I do. I'm, because I'm, I have cash. Be, because well, I need liquidity. Um, I, right. I, I, my question is why anybody in their right mind would own a bond, a, a fixed income instrument longer than three years in duration. Uh, that astonishes me. I can understand why you as a property owner <laughs> might want to have a 30 year fixed mortgage, but it's beyond me to understand why somebody would own one. <laughs> right. I, I see, I see real estate as a bond, if you know what I mean. I, uh, I, I highly love this bond. I, 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 well, we can we can deal with that after the break. Uh, I love your lessons around real estate. I, I think they're extremely responsive. The idea that the replacement value of your asset goes up so new people can't compete with you. Uh, your return on capital employed goes up as rents go up, but your cost of capital stays fixed. Money is made in the delta between the return on capital employed and the cost of capital. Uh, and what you've done in your own lifetime should be uh, of real value is a lesson to your listeners. Right. And there's one more thing I, I like about real estate is I don't pay taxes. 
you know, it's called appreciation, depreciation, amortization. The, the, the magic words of love. <laughs> the idea that you can finance out uh, with no tax consequence is astonishing to me. Uh, well, during I, when, Hillary, when Trump was running against Hillary and Hillary attacks Trump and says, and you don't even pay taxes, right. Trump says, because I'm smart. Right. <laughs> I think he lost half the population right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're we're running that risk here, but we don't talk to that half. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's it's how people are unsophisticated as a word, right? So, I have another question for you. Another argument in the in the world. We want to talk about this central bank CBDCs. And one more thing is what I'm the optimist on. Is you talk about technology and things changing. I invest, I have gold and silver, but I like silver because it's an industrial metal as well as a precious metal. And um, industrial means it's consumed. So while we're producing silver, it's also being, you know, it disappears into junkyards and stuff like this. Every computer dumps silver. So that's I'd like to ask your point of view on what is the future of silver? Is it with technology going up? Does it consume more? Or am I just smoking weed on this one? Uh, I think the debate comes down to whether you're forward looking or rear looking. Traditionally, gold has been a store of wealth. Uh, right. Gold and silver have both been mediums of exchange. Right. Uh, that would argue that as an insurance asset, gold, because of its history, is a more reliable asset. Looking forward, a billion ounces of silver a year go to silver heaven. Right now, gold is different. It goes from a hole in the ground called a mine to a hole in the ground called a vault. <laughs> right. Uh, everybody, wait, everybody, please, please listen to what Rick just said. That's the biggest difference between gold and silver. Right. Okay, please. Uh, silver is disappearing. But you know, silver goes away. So you right. could have a, a silver shortage. Uh, and a lot of the silver, I mean, a lot of silver gets recycled. It used to get 90% used to get recycled in photography. But now that we're doing things like making silver panels, uh, the price of silver and the technology isn't uh, high enough to recycle that silver so far from silver panels. The most important emerging use for silver is as a germicide in sewage treatment and water treatment. And in that application, the silver absolutely gets used up. So it's important to note, uh, as you have stated, that in addition to being uh, a medium of exchange uh, and a medium of exchange that's simultaneously a store of wealth, there's an industrial utility around silver in electric applications, uh, in solar and photovoltaic applications, and importantly, uh, in water and waste processing applications that gives silver uh, a, a much different uh, impetus. In fact, I would argue that as you talk about the energy transmission uh, and, and battery, the new age metals, uh, that silver's applications in microelectronics uh, and photovoltaics uh, make it as important a discussion there as other minerals like nickel and lithium. Right. So again, again that's my question. You, you talk about how you're optimistic about technology and new inventions and all this stuff. But for me personally, being a lay person, I just see it as so they're going to keep using more silver. Am I off base? No, on I think, base. I, I think I think you're very on base. I think that silver is inherently more speculative than gold, and I don't think yes. speculation's a bad thing. Uh, no, no I, I am partly a speculator. So I, right, I right. It's, right. it's called it's called buy low, sell high. You know what I mean? It's called I, like people say, "Well, are you buying Bitcoin?" I said, "I did." Right. And I bought Bitcoin at six. But will I buy it today? Probably not. Right. Do, do you know what I mean? So I, I'm what I, I, I'm, I'm equating silver to Bitcoin when it was zero. You yeah. know what I'm yeah. And and it's being consumed. Yes. That's what shocks me right now. You know, uh, another thing that your your listeners who are interested in silver need to understand is that most silver doesn't come out of silver mines. Uh, it comes out of gold mines, uh, copper mines, lead mines, mine. zinc mines. And, and what that means is that if the silver price goes up, it doesn't necessarily stimulate more production of silver. 
the copper price has to go up, the lead price has to go up, and the zinc price have to go up. Uh, apparently, as I understand it now, between 17 and 18 percent uh, of the new silver supply in the world comes from silver supply, comes from silver mines. The rest come as a byproduct of other minerals production. So when you think about uh, the various uses of silver and you think about the inelasticity of supply, uh, the potential, not the guarantee, but the potential for outsize gains uh, as the demand for silver increases more rapidly than the industry can supply it. Uh, it's a very interesting speculative setup. Yeah, like when I, the word speculative, like when I when I talk to people about Bitcoin, by the way, what's his name? Peter Schiff went to Bitcoin finally. I mean, that's-, that's I didn't see that. I didn't oh see God, that. yeah, he, he converted, he switched sides and all this stuff, but okay. I'm cracking up. So Rick, there's a couple of questions. You, know, I'm a, you're, you have Battle Bank and all this stuff and you're getting heavily into should I say the financial services business and with all your experience, I'm kind of interested in what you're thinking, you know, you and I about the same vintage and all this, we should be taking a break, but I think you and I are working harder now than ever before. And there's so many questions I want to ask you, but the next question I want, I'm asking for your wisdom on is what is, what do you think about CBDCs? Like my friends, Jim Record <clears throat> is talking about executive order 14067, where Biden says they're gonna come out with a Fed coin. What are your thoughts on that? For me personally, the CBDC, central bank digital currency is the single scariest development that I'm aware of. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I guess subordinated to nuclear weapons, but only to nuclear <laughs> weapons. <laughs> The idea. Right, 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 right. I hate to interrupt you, but I went to this AI conference, you know, art, artificial intelligence. Right. And I was speaking at a group of these. I'm kind of a wise ass. That's why I flunked out of school all the time. But somebody said, What is AI? I said, A college degree. <laughs> and I cracked it. <laughs> but anyway, I was at this conference and I met this young woman who was one of the lead uh, investors in AI. She's probably 26 years old. And I was talking to her and she says, AI scares her more than anything else. And so, so plus you got, you say yeah. CBTC is dangerous. We got AI coming and we have election coming up. What else could scare the heck out of us? <laughs> well, I guess for me, it's the combination of uh, social credit scoring, AI and the central bank digital currency. The idea right. that the government can monitor who we are online and other places uh, assign our behavior uh, uh, values uh, according to their own precepts. There's uh, and, and then if they want to cancel our money. Right. Uh, that's very scary. I watched, uh, what, three, four months ago when Prime Minister Trudeau in Canada objected oh. to the political activities of the truckers. Right. Uh, and, and he retroactively made contributions to them illegal and froze the bank and brokerage accounts of Canadians right. who disagreed uh, with his uh, political policies. Right. And I look now at the social credit scoring that takes place in the People's Republic of China. And right. the idea that a government could <clears throat> object to your exercise of freedom of thought and freedom of speech and object to the extent that they could cancel your wealth uh, and who among us would put that past Xi or Trudeau or Biden or for that matter, Trump? Nobody right. I know. I would prefer a world where Robert Kiyosaki was free to think uh, and free to express himself as he believed and where Robert Kiyosaki's money and wealth belonged to Robert Kiyosaki and were not subject to the whims of the right. given Congress. Well, so this is, the, you set it up perfectly because this is my logic system. You know, like I said, since 72 and I was flying in Vietnam, I said, you know, when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, they started printing quantitative easing. My idea has been if I save silver in green boxes yep. and those are just silver coins. And I had, I had a friend of mine, he's an attorney, because I convinced him to save silver and gold. He says, yeah, I got them at my house. I said, 
you stupid SOB. You just told everybody to come visit you, you know. Don't keep your gold and silver at your house. I mean, that's ridiculous. But anyway, my my theory is right now, I'm gonna have this, I share the same concerns, AI, technology, uncertain geo, geopolitical terms, and what happened in Russia just this week with them threatening Putin. I, for years, I just have green boxes hidden in a private vault safe, right. tons of it. And my reason for thinking this is I want to test, I don't care if you say this is really stupid logic, but if they go to CBDC, I can spend the silver coins. I mean, I can get off the uh, system of the federal government. So I can walk around and say, hey, Rick, I got uh, 10 silver coins. Mm -hmm. What do you give me? You don't know what, you know, they can't be traced. That's I, I like the idea of silver coins being untraceable or not followed by the government. How's my logic on that? Absolutely flawless. Uh, sadly, okay. absolutely flawless. I, you know, I think another point, Robert, you talked about the practical impacts, and I was struck as you were talking about it. I was struck thinking about a young man in 1970, 1971, 1972, <clears throat> a young patriot, maybe misguided, but a young patriot. Uh, were you fighting for a world where the government could cancel your freedom of speech, where a government could cancel your wealth? When you think about the concept of politics today, I think one of the things that the government is doing is degrading the memory of hundreds of thousands of people who have fought and died for freedom in the United States. And it's just right. disgusting to me. Well, you hit a big subject because today, as we're speaking, Arizona State University, I taught in an entrepreneur's class last summer in, at Arizona State. And then uh, Dennis Prager, myself, and my doctor, Gopalan, He's a cardio cardiologist and a doctor of acupuncture. We did an event in Arizona State called Health, Wealth, Happiness. You know, I mean, yep. subversive stuff. Nice, nice. <laughs> professors came after us. <clears throat> they fired anybody who had anything to do with us. These are the professors, Rick. Yep. Thirty-seven of them. Yep. I was on Fox News yesterday. They're not me, but the the executive director who got fired from the honors program. This is the honors teaching honors kids. And the professors were threatened by us teaching health, wealth, and happiness. So your question was saying, is saying, what did we fight for? We yep. fought for our freedom. Yep. Yep. And we've lost it. Yep. And so that's, that makes me, uh, you know, the green, the green uh, boxes of silver and coins and all this stuff. I don't trust my government at all at this moment. I think we're Gestapo state, yep. electronic. As I say, for me, other than perhaps nuclear weapons, the scariest technological application in, in the hands of the state yeah. is this idea around CBDC. It's just absolutely yeah. disgusting. So, Rick, you know, I'm, I've taken more of, you, more of your time. Is Would you explain, uh, like, you know, <clears throat> we're on the eve of destruction, you start battle bank. Uh, <laughs> as the Mexicans would say, que pasa? What the heck are you up to? Are you going back to war or something with the bank? Well, some of it's personal, Robert. As you know, I retired, right. and retirement doesn't suit me. No. <laughs> My mind needs to be stimulated or anesthetized, and working is better for me than drinking. Uh, so yes. that's a personal response. But there's right. never been a better time to go in the banking business. This is my seventh de novo bank. Uh, so the first part of the answer is that uh, this same management team and I started a bank in 1998 called EverBank addressing a need in the market that wasn't met by existing banks. We built it from zero to $28 billion in AUM and then sold it. It was a nice exercise and the customers loved us. <laughs> After we sold it, the customers began to email us saying our, our bank has left us. <laughs> you know, an entrepreneur like you or I, uh, when a market segment reaches out to us uh, and there's a need, <clears throat> it's instinctive that we fill it. So what right. will... What will Battle Bank be? I would argue, Robert, that it'll be a sanity-based bank. Uh, it'll be a bank with real money in it. It will be a bank that if they use derivatives, it'll be to hedge credit rate risk, not to trade. Uh, it will be a bank that understands that your money is your money. Rather than having 15 savings products, five of which pay no interest, 
we'll have one saving product. You can write checks against it or not as you choose. Wow. And by the way, you'll be able to have a money market account in over 20 currencies. You'll be wow. able to buy CDs in over 20 currencies. Self-directed? Self-directed? Yes, sir. I mean, I, I decided. Speaking, speaking of self-directed, Robert, you'll love this. Uh, we believe your IRA is your IRA. So your IRA can own uh, a, a uh, LLC, and you can, in your IRA, legally own rental properties, single family homes, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, mm -hmm. small commercial properties. Uh, why should I tell you what you have to invest your IRA in? Uh, and, and then on the lending side, you know, I've been a lender my whole life. I used to describe myself as a used money salesman. Um, <laughs> we propose a, as a key line of our business to lend money to investors against physical gold and silver held in segregated accounts. Wow. Uh, wow. Right now, there's about $30 trillion in the U.S., wow. $30 billion, pardon me, in the U.S. in bullion held at Brinks, Loomis, and Viamat. Nobody wow. wants to lend against it. Now, I happen wow. to believe that gold and silver are good collateral. They're liquid. <laughs> uh, the, I mean, this is why I'm in the banking business. The, the banking business is a huge business. And in many senses, the banks have forgotten who their customer is. I'm not going to tell you the bank, but I went to a branch of a great big bank that I've done business with since the 1960s. Went into the branch, very nice branch manager. Uh, and when I talked to her about savings products, she pointed me to a white service phone, I guess, to connect me to India. She didn't know about her savings products. So what benefit did the branch offer me? What the branch does is it adds over 1% to the cost of funds for the bank. Uh, at our bank, like our last bank, your branch, our branch, pardon me, is going to be your phone. Uh, because we don't have wow. this multiplicity of, u of useless bank branches, we can have right. very high quality bankers that you can talk to on the phone. We'll answer the phone by the fifth ring and you'll talk to a human. You won't talk to an answering machine. That'll be different. You won't have to wade through 15 savings products. There will be one. If you want to own a wow. duplex in your IRA, our answer will be yes. If you want to borrow money against physical gold and silver, uh, our answer will be yes. We aren't going to try to be all things to all people, but we're going to try and do seven or eight things, either better than anybody else or do seven or eight things that nobody else does. Okay. Uh, so let me, ask, let, me, let me ask this question, Rick. So here I am. I'm living in Phoenix, Arizona. I want to become a customer of Battle Bank. What do I have to do? Go to battlebank.com. Uh, and sign up, uh, and we will uh, have you on the pre-opening list to distribute information about our products and services as soon as the FDIC gives us the green light. Right. Uh, alternatively, you can go to ruleinvestmentmedia.com. Uh, there's a drop-down form, and I should talk about that, by the way. Any of your listeners who care what I have to say uh, about resources can go to ruleinvestmentmedia.com, list their natural resource stocks, and I'll personally rank them. In the comment section there, uh, if you care about Battle Bank, just write in bank, <laughs> and I'll make sure you get the information. Okay. Well, Rick, thank you. I've taken you about 20 minutes over time. I really appreciate it. Like I say, ladies and gentlemen, you know, when Rick Rule speaks, people like me listen, you know, the, the people who swear are on the eve of destruction. You know, I've paid close attention to Rick, has um, made me a lot of money. And uh, I really appreciate your, your service as an educator to the world, as well as being a great, you know, inspiration to the world. Well, so likewise, Rick, I, I would suggest that you're the, you're the rich dad to hundreds of thousands of people across the country. And so thank you for that. Oh, thank you very much. This podcast is a presentation of Rich Dad Media Network.